Hey guys, and welcome to episode 53 of the Physique Development Podcast. Today, we are going to be going over a little bit of a prep update for myself. If you don't know, uh, Alex is my coach and my husband, and we also co-own this business together, uh, and I am in prep. <laughs> so <laughs> that's kind of catching you up on everything you need to know for the bare bones of this. Um, but I'm about, not I am about, I am 10 weeks into a dieting phase into prep. Um, and we thought we would give you more of an update. If you go ahead and go back to episode 27 of the podcast, Alex and I went over my entire improvement season and we went pretty in depth on things. And I'll also have linked in the show notes a podcast I did with um, Jeremiah Bear going over kind of a month muscle building phase. And um, it kind of if you listen to that episode 27 and that podcast episode with Jeremiah, you'll get a very clear view of my improvement season um, mindset that I had to take towards it, as well as all of the hoops that we jumped through. So we thought we would give you an update. We are a little over or over halfway through prep for the first show, about two thirds through prep as a whole. Yeah. Um, and things are moving smoothly. I think that um, it, I would be remiss to not, for the individuals who are watching this on YouTube, we have a little bit of a change in setup, as you guys have seen over the past uh, three weeks or so. Mm -hmm. We've increased our video quality, which you guys have commented and, and loved. And now you see that we've uh, put a little bit of spruced up the space <laughs> within our, our chairs and the, the backdrop and all that fun stuff. There's more to come, but um, lots of, you know, going into this, lots of good stuff. Yeah, we're really excited. We'll be actually adding some art behind us. Um, and uh, this will probably be like the first room in the his house that is like fully decked out. Yes. For, for those that were unaware, this is just a bedroom in our home. <laughs> <laughs> but right now it looks like a legit podcast good. studio yeah, yeah, yeah. with this wall and good. these new chairs. So shout out. <laughs> um, but we thought that going over my prep would be very helpful, especially since we have the whole series on what to know as a first time competitor. We've talked through my fitness journey, Alex's fitness journey, my improvement season. Um, and so we wanted to do a few more updates here on prep itself. And the main things that we're going to talk about are going to be talking about about how I'm balancing the different things that are on my plate right now, um, how this relates to previous preps, as well as the dynamic between Alex and I. Because like I said at the beginning, we are husband and wife. Uh, we are also co-owners of this business. And then we are also coach clients. So that's a lot of relationships to unpack and work through. And I think it's helpful to talk through that dynamic because I know I've personally learned a lot from the client perspective and from the coaching perspective that I can carry forward within my, my own coaching. Yeah, absolutely. So do you want to walk people through kind of what's on your plate? And we'll, we'll kind of touch on each thing. I don't want to just go off bullet points and kind of giving people context of what's been going on. But uh, if you want to give us a, a general gist of what's been on your plate, uh, I, I think the listeners would really love to hear that. Yeah, I'm going to talk through a few things on my plate. And then I think that it would also be helpful for me to possibly run through kind of what a day looks like. Um yeah, I might do both. But um, on my plate right now, I am working with one on one clients. Um, and then I also have um, education clients or consults that I'm doing. So those are consultations that are either scheduled twice a month or once a month or one off consultations to be able to help people out um, and mentor people. And then those one on one clients and I have a pretty full roster that I am trimming down to be able to take on some more managerial stuff within PD. So that's another thing on my plate right now is that we are restructuring the business as a whole. As we continue to grow, there's a lot of things that we're learning along the way. Yeah. Um, and if you haven't heard us talk about it before, Alex Austin and I have kind of just bootstrapped this company and just from pure will and work ethic made it into what it is today. And we've had, of course, support and help along the way, but it's been a lot of, let's try and see how it works. Yeah. And so we were trying and seeing how it works 
worked for all of us to have full rosters and have a team, and that wasn't working. And so we recognized that we needed to shift some things around. And so I'm in a place that I am really taking on that CEO role with NPD and being able to uh, make sure that we're providing for the coaches on staff the way that they need to, as well as continuing to push the company forward because we're spending a lot of time working um, in the business instead of on the business. So we're kind of switching that as well as all the content. So like Alex said, we've really stepped up our game full, full blast. Um, not only within this podcast of being regularly filming, like we've gotten a, a podcast out every single week since before the new year started. And that was a huge goal. We went from not posting as frequently on our Instagrams to having 15 plus posts a, a month. Um, and then being able to hire Miguel, which has been been awesome. Um, and so we now have a full-time videographer and we've been cranking out content and reels and videos and YouTube. So again, if you're watching this on YouTube, you've seen a lot of quality content come through. Um, just being more front facing on all social media um, platforms as well as everything prep related. So cardio for prep, step goals for prep, training for prep, um, as well as the food aspect, cooking, meal prepping, grocery shopping, miscellaneous stuff around the house, like cleaning, dishes, laundry, groceries, um, miscellaneous appointments, uh, taxes, and stuff like that. Well, we said we weren't going to give bullet points, oh, but... sorry. <laughs> Already messed up. <laughs> uh, let's, come, let's come back to some of the things uh, within the prep, because we kind of just skimmed over that within uh, those factors, within your training, within your cardio, within um, the, the nutritional allocations, within, within prep, what has been some of the more challenging components within this new schedule? Because this is a completely different approach than we've taken, um, or that this is the first prep that Sue and I have worked together specifically for. Fully. Uh, fully, right. And so what has been, with all the changes going on with the business, what, have, what has that been like within the prep itself? been hard. <laughs> Point blank, that's like how I would answer it. This has definitely been the most responsibility I've ever had. Each prep has been, the mo I feel like I'm like the Bachelor or American Idol where they're like, this is the most dramatic season yet, or this is the best season yet. But it truly feels that way of each season I've competed. Like, this is the most I've had on my plate yet. This is the most I've had to juggle, the most responsibility, the most I've had to show up. And this one one far above anything else, the most responsibility I've ever had. And that is a lot because I want to show up for this prep. And I'm very much so of the mindset. And I know Alex shares this. If you've decided to diet, that is something that you decided to do. And so I really don't love to complain or I don't love to make excuses um, or even talk about like, oh, I have this, this, and this because I made the decision to purposely restrict food and go into this prep knowing what it required out of me or having an idea of what it required out of me. And so I need to show up for that because that is a complete choice that I made. Um, and so being able to figure out how to now change my role and then how to show up for prep has been trial and error, just like everything else in life is you're going to try some things, you're going to see what works and what doesn't. And then you're going to kind of audit um, or reflect and then take that next step forward. Um, so to answer your specific question of kind of what's been the hardest thing um, of balancing all of it is just the planning and being more in tune with what I can handle in a day, as well as how long things take me on a day-to-day -day basis so I can schedule things better and better. Yes. I think that one thing that you've done a really good job of and something that I uh, share with all of our prep clients is the factor in which um, you have to put yourself in a position where you have very little time to waste. And I think that that's something that you've done a really good job of is putting yourself in a place where you are maximizing the time and ut utilizing your time efficiently um, with all the factors that you have going on because all the things that you're doing are very important to you. And so I, I think that that's one big thing that the listeners can take from this. And, and as you listen to Sue kind of talk through the different factors in which she's accomplishing over this, uh, gosh, six month period, mm -hmm. um, to prioritize the things that are important to you and, and pour yourself into that, put yourself in a position where you're not capable of 
not doing anything like they're the only option for you is to, to succeed. Yeah. That, that is the only possible outcome that has, that can come to fruition because of the work that you're putting in. Mm-hmm. It would be, it feels as though it would be impossible for you to not succeed because it's all that you're, you're doing. Right. Yeah. And I think that if you're looking for extreme results, you have to, to venture into the extremes and really put yourself in a position where it's uncomfortable and, and being okay with being uncomfortable is something that you've done a really good job of over this past, like I said, six months. And really since we've gotten married, um, <laughs> it has been, been a, a <laughs> it has been a sprint, uh, from the start. And I think that this year is, uh, cha- the most challenging of them all, uh, just as we've had, and this is the most hats that we've had to put on and take off and so on and so forth. But I think that, um, you've done a really good job so far with, within the prep itself. And, um, what are some of the things within your the prep that has been different than than years past yeah well first I want to say thank you <laughs> I will take the compliments um, and take them in stride as well as knowing that I have shown up and done exactly what I said I was going to do and that's just one small thing off of what Alex said is at the beginning I was like man are we clinically crazy for deciding to do everything that we're doing all at once. And I've told a few friends when they're like, hey, how are you doing? I'm like, I honestly am very glad that I'm in prep right now because it does force me to be such a habit of or such a creature of habit because without prep, I'm still doing plenty. I have plenty on my plate to get done, but it makes it so that like with prep, I know that I have other people that I like with Alex, I'm not going to let Alex down within prep. And so I'm also not going to let myself down. And so knowing I have these fail safes, like Alex said, the only option is to succeed and is to figure out my schedule. So that has been huge of, I know that I work best putting my feet to the fire. And so you have to know how you are going to succeed the best. And I didn't even know that about myself until I met Alex and he really pushed me to put my feet to the fire. And I was like, oh crap, this is where I thrive is putting myself in the these situations, of course, having times where I'm not completely in the fire, but putting myself in these situations where just I have to show up. Um, And that's been phenomenal because there's no other option. Um, So as far as what things are different from previous preps versus now is basically everything. (laughs) Um, So Alex did, has done my training since my, after my first prep, he took over my training. So in 2017, and he's been doing my training for all of my preps um, since then, but another coach has been doing my nutrition. So in previous preps at this point, as far as how many weeks that I am out, I would have extremely lower food. I bet if I went back and I do have all the data, so I could have gone back, but I didn't. My food was definitely lower. My cardio was definitely higher. Um, Scale weight was used as the main objective within those coaches. Um, It was also something that the coaches that I was working with weren't working with a lot of natural athletes. And so they weren't well versed on what to do with a natural athlete, as well as a bikini athlete. And that's something within coaching of I should have realized like, hey, these coaches aren't working with a lot of bikini athletes or um, that their focus or their um, expertise is elsewhere, Um, as well as I was really run into the ground. Recovery wasn't as big of a priority. And so versus now, food is the highest it's been this late in prep. Um, I've had lower cardio than average. Um, The scale is just a tool, which I'll talk about here in a second. Um, Alex really understands natural and enhanced athletes. So I'm very happy to have him on my side, like truthfully, not just saying this because he's my husband and because I love the heck out of him, but he is freaking amazing at what he does. And I'm reminded of it every time he sends me a transformation of a client where I'm like, oh my gosh, you're so good at your job. And he is just so phenomenal. And it's such a, like, it's like night and day from other coaches, not to say that those coaches I worked with weren't good at what they did, but to see the level of care, the level of understanding, the level of willingness to dig into something to truly make sure it's the best decision. 
um, as well as just like the way his brain works. He's in like a completely different <laughs> world than the rest of us. And I'm very thankful for that. So he has that understanding of natural versus enhanced and knowing what, when to push and pull, which is like the biggest thing with a natural athlete. Um, and then he obviously understands my life and my headspace. So um, I, I do want to make a quick note on how important communication is, where it's a lot easier in one regard because he understands what my daily life looks like. Um, there's other things that are harder for us because he is also wearing all those different hats. Um, but it's just a note to say, like, I made mistakes. And for, so like me saying, like, what previous preps looked like, I could have been better at vocalizing where I was at, where recovery was, how I was truly feeling and giving them a greater understanding of my day and speaking up. So that's something that's on me as much as it's um, kind of like push and pull with that with the past coaches. Um, recovery is one of the largest focuses because Alex knows my body. He has years of data and he's been able to really get to know my body and know when, again, he needs to push and pull um, and being able to match training and nutrition instead of just playing off of other coaches. Because before it was the coaches giving the nutrition and Alex just on the ball trying to switch the training to make sure it matched, which he did a, a phenomenal job with. But when you're in control of both, it makes things a little bit easier. Um, and then um, I have a lot more responsibility. So I'm needing more organization, which has been good. Um, we've kind of done different structures for free meals versus refeeds. Let's, let's unpack some of the stuff that you were talking about before. Okay. So when we look at communication, I think that this is something that a lot of clients with their coaches struggle with. Mm -hmm. What do you feel as though is some of the prerequisites to create the best communication? Because you do have a little bit of a leg up that it's your husband. Yeah. So I'm going to have a, a, an intimate relationship with you. There's, it's very multifactorial. And our communication has blossomed because of all the other facets, mm -hmm. including this one, but uh, amongst all of them. So you have a little bit of a leg up for those are, that are listening that are like, I feel like I should be conveying or having a better relationship with my coach. What are some of the things that you feel as though are important to have the best communication with your coach? Um, well, one big part is being able to even have true and honest conversation with yourself as like, as that seems like a weird thing to bring up when I'm talking about communication with another person, you can't communicate correctly with another person if you're not even in tune with yourself, tracking different metrics and can be honest with yourself and to be able to vocalize those things that you need to. That's like the number one thing is if you're not working on communication with yourself or with other relationships, I can promise you when it comes to a coach, it's not going to be really any better. So just working on communication skills in general is going to be a huge aspect, but also knowing what that line is for what information do they need to know about my life um, and when am I just dumping information on them. So as a client, you do have a responsibility. Yes, the coach is there to guide you, but they don't know what they don't know. And I think that that's something that I've been so vocal with clients over the past year or two of saying, hey, I am not in your daily life. As assume that I know nothing because I don't know anything from your day-to-day -day life except what you've expressed to me. And so being able to say like, hey, these are where my stressors are. These are things that either I need to do about it or you just need to be aware of them. This is how my sleep is going. Like truly answering the questions and being so truthful because in the past, another thing with coaches is I would just, I didn't want them to feel like I was complaining or weak. And so I wouldn't tell them when something was like extremely difficult for me to do or I was struggling. And that's what I'm saying of like my communication in the past wasn't as good with other coaches. And that's on me of I didn't vocalize, hey, this is really weighing on me or this is really hard. I would just be like, yep, I'll get it done. And that's a great headspace and mentality to have. But at the same time, if you're running yourself into the ground and the coach doesn't know that and then they're implementing these things and you're saying you feel great then how are they supposed to make any changes off of that? So truthfully, putting yourself in the position of, hey, when I'm doing a job for someone else, I can only do it with the information that I have. 
and then carry that forward into a coaching relationship of, hey, this person can only do what they're supposed to do if they know these things about me. Instead of thinking like, oh, I can't tell them that I'm constipated because that's TMI, or I can't tell them that my period really makes me have all of this pain and all these side effects because like that's a boy and he doesn't want to talk about menstrual cycles or whatever it may be. Like those are important things to note. And that boundary between like dumping and telling is going to be a fine line sometimes of, hey, you might need to let someone in. Like the reason my stress is high is because this is happening. Um, But instead of just saying, hey, all of this is happening and then just dumping it on that person's lap, that's also not very fair. So what are your kind of thoughts on that from a coaching perspective of what you feel like clients have a hard time communicating to you um, or that is the most helpful for clients to communicate to you? Well, I think within my experience, I work with a lot of coaches themselves. And I think that a big part is that they don't want to seem lesser than mm-hmm. in the the concept of like how they think or what they know about a topic. And they're cautious to ask questions or to not be 100%. I think that that's a big thing is that, and, and I struggle with this when I'm checking in with my own coach, is that I have to come from a place of, I know that I want my coach to think highly of me and I want my coach to be proud of the work that I'm putting in. But like some weeks are just shit, dude. I mean, that I, the weeks just don't go as they are planned and you may not get, and this is out of the context of contest prep, please uh, preface this in the mm-hmm. sense that like missing training sessions, missing food, not really gonna fly in a contest prep setting. I, as you can see, if you're watching YouTube, not in contest prep. <laughs> and so um, within that, I have to I have to check myself when I'm even filling out my own check-ins of being or coming from a place of vulnerability and being willing to be okay with it not looking the best necessarily. Because I know that for many, you want to check in and it be flying colors and making you hit PRs every training session, you hit your food every day, you got your cardio, you slept perfectly, your digestion's perfect. And I know that many of you, when you send in your check-ins, know that that's one out of every eight check-ins, one out of every six check-ins, something along those lines. As much as we want it to happen, things happen and there's going to be things that come up. And by not addressing those issues and, and being like, no, my digestion was great. Whereas you maybe went three days without a bowel movement and you just tell the coach that it's okay. I don't know that. I, I don't know that that's that you're bending the truth a little bit on that front. And so it's very important to be okay with those factors being shared and um, all of that. So I think that that's kind of, you know, multi piece there, but yeah. um, a lot of different things. I think it's just taking responsibility. So if you know, hey, my digestion was off, but I also ate foods that I know don't sit well with me and I didn't prioritize my sleep, say that in a check-in of, hey, yes, my digestion was off. I know what it was. I'm already going to change those instead of just saying my digestion was off. And then it's, okay, another layer of saying, all right, well, how are these metrics? How are you feeling here? What have you done? The more that you can kind of reflect on your your life, because again, you're the one living it, the easier it's going to be for everyone involved and the more progress you're going to see as well and the better headspace you're going to have because it doesn't feel good to lie either yeah. or to bend the truth. It doesn't feel good because then you feel like you're disappointing them, you're disappointing yourself, and then you feel like you have to make up for it the next week. And that's a really hard place to come from. So the more that you can just be transparent and take responsibility and have that honesty, you're going to see that flying forward. Yeah. And I think that also coming back to the point of you speaking to having higher food, this prep and having less cardio, this prep is an important piece for us to have greater context to, um, because some of these individuals maybe haven't heard what your, um, you know, leading into this prep, what that's been like. And I think that, um, if you want to kind of dig into that, I can also, you know, give some points too, but I think we would love to hear what you, like, why is that the case? A big part of it is I wasn't managing my stress or eating the foods I know I needed to be eating. Now, of course, it is multifaceted. It's not just point blank. That's it. There was a lot, there's a lot of layers to everything that my fitness journey, especially since competing, has encapsulated. But uh, a big part of that was, like I said, the coaches were very much so reliant on just the scale. And so if the scale didn't move, food was cut. And then that was that. And I didn't say anything and 
just kept moving forward. But if I look back on my first and second prep, while I was still eating whole foods, I definitely was having more processed stuff, going more IIFYM, um, not paying attention to my digestion as much and not addressing my stress or knowing what foundational things needed to be in place. Coming into this prep, I not only had over a year and a half away from the stage, but I was able to really nail down me, my routines, and I felt the best that I've ever felt before even starting this prep, which has definitely not been the case beforehand. And I feel like so many people just try to rush to get back on stage instead of thinking, have I got the foundations nailed down? Am I eating food that serves me? Do I have a routine for cooking that food? Because if you try to jump into prep and you don't have a routine already in place, prep is going to smack you upside down. The f- up, up the side of your face and you're got, not going to know what hit you. And then you're going to wonder why you're not seeing the progress forward. And it's because you've just really tried to do a complete overhaul and act like it's normal. And so like huge things were just getting in a better spot with my hormones, getting in a better spot with my sleep, um, being in a better spot with our relationship and our foundation, um, knowing what foods sit well, having a plan for meal prep, um, and having that all in place was ginormous for that being where it needs to be. Um, And another thing as far as food, and this might be what you want to dig into a little bit more, why food has been able to be higher or or have that um, lower cardio in place is my body is just functioning more optimally. And so I'm going to see results better instead of trying to compound a system that's not functioning. Yeah. And and I think, well, this is the first prep that you've ever gone into with optimized hormonal health um, and a consistent cycle and those different factors. I would say that those factors are the, that, and then also the component of this is the best conditioning that you started a prep in as well. Mm -hmm. Um, We weren't coming from a place of excess surplus. I think that that's a big thing that uh, clients get into is that they want to have the ability to uh, get on Instagram and showcase, I'm eating 500, 600 grams of carbs in my off season. Look at me, I'm getting carbs or life type situation. And I'm all for eating as much carbs as you, as you can. But there's a point in which we're just adding excess body fat. We're not adding more quality tissue. It's just continuously adding more body fat for the sheer fact of saying that I'm eating this amount of food where it's not actually increasing the muscle density. It's not increasing your training performance or the quality of your sleep or, or hormonal health. It's, it could be actually hindering those things. And so we want to be very cognizant of those factors and not where the quantity of the food that we are eating in the improvement season as a badge of honor. And there's, there's a a give and take to that. Of course, we're not, Sue was definitely not eating 1600 calories in her improvement Mm -hmm. season. She was still eating a very high allotment of, of calories for her body mass. And we kept her at a body fat level that one was great for her mental health and also was conducive for her overall performance and hormonal health that we saw the greatest increase in muscle density, as well as, um, you know, strides across all facets within your life. And so I think that those are the things that people really have to focus on that the time in your improvement season is not to dilly dick around. And, um, well, I'm tracking three or four days and, and there may be a situation that you need from a mental health standpoint to, to take time away from tracking or to track less. But in that context, it's not just kind of wishy-washy and I'm giving 60% effort. And then the, the next year rolls around the show that you did the year prior is now on the schedule. And you know that it's coming up. It's like, I'm going to do it again because I want to do better than I did last time. Well, the work that you put in, in between show one and now going to be show two, doesn't really showcase that you're going to actually improve. You're just going to get up there again. It's going to be a harder time to have success, to lose that body fat. And you're not going to see much progress. It may be a lesser physique than what you had on that stage the first time because you had to bury yourself into cardio, into a very deep deficit to be able to lose that same amount of body fat that you would the first time. So taking the time in the improvement season to actually improve, it's a beautiful thing. And it, it, it is in the name to do. And Sue did that. She did that for years. Yeah. And it was an optimization of every single day and, and, 
I, I, I struggle with not giving that advice of like make it every day because like if you're wanting to have exceptional results, especially in a natural setting, we can, we can kind of cut some corners, if you will, from an enhanced perspective, not saying that it's easier, but I am saying that there are some gaps that can be filled a little bit more quickly with an enhanced athlete relative to a natural athlete. For my natural athletes, I am very, very, and even for my enhanced athlete, this goes across the board. I am very, very, um, I don't know, pushy is not the right word. I am adamant. Adamant. There we go. <laughs> I am adamant that it, it is a just as like intense, if you will, going into that improvement season and every day has to be taken with that intent. Because if your goal is to, to be an IFBB pro is to get up on the pro stage and be competitive, that's a big goal. There's a lot of women speaking to bikini that want to do that and that there are, are gunning for that same position. And there's thousands of people that are going to compete every year and you're wanting to be one of the top ones that turn pro that year. And so if that's your goal, you have to act accordingly. And if you're not doing that and just kind of pitter pattering around in your improvement season, don't be upset when you don't get the outcome that you wanted. Mic drop. <laughs> um, but I mean, truthfully, that is that encompasses it all of when we're talking about competing, we're talking about competing. Obviously, there's a whole different realm when we talk about lifestyle. So I want to make it uber clear, we're talking about competing. So if you're not a competitor or wanting to be a competitor, this doesn't apply to you. But knowing that to accomplish a large goal like being a pro so a pro athlete do you think any pro athlete gets there by just dilly dicking around probably not no. actually they don't um so if you think of a pro football player pro soccer player pro tennis player whatever you want to say that takes years and years and time and dedication and i know some of you might not look at bodybuilding the same way as you look at some of those sports but it still is a sport and it still requires that effort every freaking day and so i am very clear with people of this balance that people are searching for i don't have that in an improvement season or in a prep because that's not my goal and that doesn't align with what I want to accomplish. Pro athletes aren't balanced. Their life is focused on that sport. Yes, they have other avenues in their life, but that's their focus. And so if you get into a place of just getting back on stage year after year, wondering where your results are, and a coach, let's say it's Alex or myself, tells you to wait, Realize that is coming from a place of we want you to actually show up and accomplish what you are saying that you want to accomplish. And that's something that we don't take lightly and we don't want to just put people on stage year after year. There's a reason I've never competed consecutive seasons because my physique and I was not ready to do that. And so being able to be brutally honest with yourself, be able to take constructive criticism from your coach instead of thinking that you know best and that you should get back on stage just because you want to, uh, as well as knowing that it takes that daily effort every single time to get that done. Um, and Alex had said this, I think actually in that episode 27, but your time away from stage is different than what your improvement season is. And the reason being is you can take time away from stage and never improve and get back on stage, or you can actually have an improvement season. So don't say, oh, I haven't competed in three years. That's a three-year improvement season. No, you haven't competed in three years, and then you didn't really follow the plan for two and a half years, so you've really only had a six-month improvement season. That doesn't mean, oh, I've had three years. I'm going to come out swinging on stage. No, you're going to come back and act like you just competed consecutive years because that's all the improvement you've allowed yourself to make. Yeah. Um, and to come back to the balance thing, I think that balance is immediately equated to happiness. And if you, you have a balanced life, then you're immediately happy. And I think that everyone's balance is going to look different. Um, for my life balance and my happiness, a lot of work goes into that. I, I, I enjoy the process of work and those different factors. And so I find happiness within the work that I'm completing. Thus, that is my balance and something that I find to be true to me. But if someone was to walk in and be like, walk in my shoes and do my day, they may not feel that it is very balanced. <laughs> very <laughs> most, <true. laughs> most would walk most in my shoes and be like, be damn, like bro, this is not balanced. But to me, this is what makes me happy. This is what makes me feel fulfilled. Um, and this is what I enjoy, especially in this chapter of my life. And as time goes on, that's going to change. And my, my balance at that time is going to be different. So I think that understanding that balance is going to look different for everyone 
is a very important piece because if we look at it and just use the standard of like what this pretty girl on Instagram mm -hmm. is saying for her balance is like, I work one hour a week and this is, I make hundreds of thousands of dollars. That's her balance. That would make me miserable. I would feel like I'm stealing from people of not putting in the work to actually earn the money that's coming in, for example. And so I think that the balance is going to look different for everyone. And, and I think that a, a lot of listeners and myself included can get caught up in the aspect of like, well, this is what balance truly looks like. This person is the perfect example. It's like, no, you're your example of balance and you have to find that for yourself. And balance is gonna change for yourself at different times in your life. Um, so I did wanna talk about one thing that I think is extremely important in a coach-client relationship as well as has been so needed throughout this prep is that trust that you have in your coach. So recently I had a prep client say that she was kind of in between check-ins. She kind of got into a whirlwind, got into her head of feeling like she wasn't ready, wasn't going to be doing stuff. And then she just kind of went into a slippery slope. And I was like, wow, I am so glad that this prep has been so different for me. And then I talked to her about why it has been. And it's because I have 100% trust in Alex. I don't need to sit and worry of if I'm ready, if I'm doing the right thing or any of that. I just need to execute point blank. And so any time that I've been, and for example, at the beginning of this prep, the scale really didn't move down in the direction that we thought it was going to, or at least that I thought it was going to, because in past preps, like I said, I started at a heavier weight, that scale would drop, 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 and it was the main metric for other coaches. So I was very honed in on the scale. The scale didn't change a ton in the first like four to six four or so weeks, four to six weeks, and I didn't really worry about it. I vocalized anytime I did have worry of like, hey, are we on the right track with Alex? Because I wanted to make sure that we continued our communication. But as soon as he said, hey, we're exactly where we need to be, and we were able to look at pictures and look at a bigger story, I was like, all right, no need to worry about it. And that helps tremendously with your stress. So many people will be their own cuckold because they will literally like shoot themselves in the foot by choosing to stress and worry about something that they don't need to. They just need to execute. So if you're finding yourself worrying and wondering if you're going to be in the right spot, first have a conversation with your coach about where your headspace is at and what you're worried about because they might be able to talk towards that. And second, make sure that you trust your coach and you're not trying to bring other cooks into the kitchen or worry yourself crazy. Because I know at the end of the day, if I've executed what Alex has asked me to execute, there's nothing that I need to sit and worry of if I'm going to be ready or if things are going to happen or if, 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 because if whatever, you don't ever know what's going to happen, but you know that your coach, Alex, has exactly a plan in place. He is going to tell me if we need to change that plan. And I just need to continue to execute that time and time again. I don't need to worry about if it's working. He's going to tell me if it is or isn't. Yeah. And I think that this is something that a lot of clients come to us or individuals who are inquiring. And I am a, a big proponent of not taking someone on and then immediately going into the prep. Um, it is something that I have not done for a long time because there's it's very challenging for the coach to just jump in and then make every call right with knowing very little on the athlete. And um, I'm not willing to give a lesser service because of the aspect in which I am shooting from the hip from the jump. Now, do I have the tools to be able to make it happen? I most definitely do. I feel he very definitely confident. definitely does. <laughs> I feel confident in, in how I go about things. I feel confident that I would be able to get the individual into shape and be great on stage. But at the same time, the enjoyment of my work is very important, important to me as well. And I enjoy the aspect of getting to understand and know the client and we can have better results by having the data collection prior. I'm able to see how their body responds to different types of training and different types of, of food allotments. Do we respond better to, uh, this, this size of a refeed? Do we respond better to a higher protein? What's our digestion look like? Um, what are some of the things that cause greater inflammation to their physique? Do we have trouble with sleep? Do we have trouble with water consumption? How is our fruit and vegetable consumption? All these different things are very challenging to get a read on in the prep. If we've already started the prep and I'm trying to figure all those things out, and that was just a off the top of the head, I'm sure there's probably 50 other things that I'm going to uh, be on that list. 
is very challenging and, and it can cause a hindrance where at, at like I just said, I don't do this, but I had two individuals who are, were very adamant that we started this prep and they were really wanted to do it. So I went ahead and did it. One individual has responded immensely well to the protocols. She's going to look fantastic. The other client did not respond well at the beginning of the, of the contest prep. Now we've, we've been able to clean things up and, and it's had to be much more aggressive than it needed to be to get to shape where she's going to look great on stage. And she is, but it does cause that issue of like, if I hit a home run right off the bat, great. But sometimes that's not going to always happen. And so putting yourself in a position where you are investing into the coach prior to the contest prep, it's going to be a much better experience for you both and a much greater likelihood of no hiccups potentially during the prep. And just to say like this as our job as coaches, we want to do the absolute best that we can for you. And if you don't give us that, how can we accomplish what results you're wanting? So you have to be extremely realistic if you're asking a coach to shoot from the freaking hip to be like, hey, I know that this might not be the perfect situation and I'm okay with that instead of thinking, oh, this coach is magic because I've seen them have all of these results with another person where there's a lot that goes into a prep and there's a lot that goes into a coach-client relationship and not having those nailed down, you're playing catch up and you're adding unnecessary stress and you are adding honestly a lot to the coach's plate of now, hey, you have to take a crash course and what my life is and now fix it all and then get me ready for stage. And that's a little bit inconsiderate when you do think about it of I wasn't allowing this person to do their job the way that they need to do it to see the success and thinking that I'm going to get the same success when I do allow them to have that space. So I think that's something I just want to vocalize like from a coach perspective that I feel like we don't get to talk about a lot of like we we want what's best for you and we want you to succeed. And it's not easy telling a client they're not ready to diet or they're not ready for stage or they're going to have to po push their show back. And trust me, it it doesn't make it any easier for us to do that either um, it, within our schedule because we plan out different things and we have that. But we're not willing to like have someone show up and just be like, oh, that was good enough because that's not really how we function. Um, and we also don't want to do crash preps because we are very focused on health, which is, again, something I've mentioned, but my health is in the best spot that it's ever been within a prep. I still have within being pretty dang close to a show right now, I still have my cycle. I'm still rocking and rolling on all the metrics that I need to. I'm going to get some hormones tested here to double check, but we're going in the direction and I'm going to be in a really positive spot post-show because of the time that I've allowed before the show, my work ethic and communication and Alex's attention to my health during the prep. And that is going to allow for pretty smooth sailing post-show. So you also want to think about yourself post-show of am I willing to put myself in this position that things aren't sturdy and it's going to be kind of a hurricane that I have to deal with in a few months after the show. Yeah, absolutely. Do you want to dig into some of the dynamic between the two of us with all the you know, 15 hats that we have on um, within our relationship and those different factors? Yeah, I think that the the big thing within the the hats that we're wearing is come from, like Alex said, of the communication. That's compounded over five years, five or six years of us really working on our communication. That has been one of the largest things that we've worked on and something I'm the most proud of within our relationship. And I don't love to give like unsolicited um, relationship advice, but I'm going to give you one thing, communication. Like that is it through and through. And I feel like I've become such a better version of myself and I have so much less like frustration or fights or tiffs or anything than I've had with anyone because we're able to communicate with one another. Another. And so within that, those different hats are a lot easier to wear because we have an understanding of the fact that we do have different hats and that there are conversations that we need to say beforehand, hey, I'm talking to you as as your wife, or I just want to talk to you as husband and wife. And sometimes we have to preface conversations of, hey, I want to talk 
coach client or I want to talk like owner to owner or I don't want to talk about work right now. Like I need some space from it. And we are very, very open within our communication of that, of, hey, past this time, don't talk to me about work. Or if someone starts to talk about something, I don't take it personally. If Alex says like, I don't want to talk about that right now or I'm not wearing my coach hat, I don't get hurt. I say, okay, I'll talk to you about it when you're wearing that hat. And then we put on our different hats and we have a conversation. So that has been been monumental within all those dynamics that we're playing is just being able to have pure, honest conversation and to be very direct of what we're trying to talk about instead of dancing around a subject or getting hurt because someone doesn't understand where you're coming from when you didn't even vocalize where you were coming from. And that, I I mean, what, what else would you say to add on to that? Yeah, I think that, um, I think the biggest thing within our communication, especially when we have uh, conflict specifically, is that no one's trying to win. Um, Mm -hmm. Understanding, especially when you have a a spouse who is in the, you you gotta go to sleep with this person. (laughs) You gotta wake up and have breakfast with this person. You got a lot of time spent. It's not, there's no value in winning a argument or something along those lines. There's much more value in being vulnerable and allowing for yourself to just come from a place of honesty of, hey, this is how I was experiencing this. This is where I was coming from. I apologize for potentially responding to that in this fashion. I understand that that was the wrong move. And then, you know, kind of going from there. That's been the biggest change, I would say, within the communication aspect of things for us. Within the hats, I think that having the definitive time cutoffs of things and just being respectful of the other person, I think that that's another thing. When we're talking about other hats, you have to look at it in a facet of how is this going to impact the other person Mm -hmm. and not just thinking selfishly of like, I need this. Everyone needs to go with what I need. Mm -hmm. It is much more looking outwardly and understanding how what you're going to say or what you're going to ask or what have you is going to impact the other person. And I think that that's how you wear the different hats as a whole. And then coming from a place of, hey, I have this coming up or I I need this addressed, when would be a good time to have a conversation with you? And not just dropping, you know, bomb after bomb on the individual, Um, because there's definitely been times in this you know, time frame within prep where we've had conflict uh, within our relationship potentially or or a tiff there. Uh, we've had, you know, things going on within the business that have been hard. And then potentially her her prep not going well that day, all on the same day. And we have to be understanding of like, those things can't bleed into the other. Mm-hmm. Those are our, all compartmentalized. And that's another thing that we have to focus very heavily when we're doing these different hats is we have to be very good at comp- compartmentalizing and being able to understand that like, if we are upset with one another from a business perspective, that we're having a disagreement on something of that nature that has nothing to do with my love for you as a, as a wife, it has nothing to do with my appreciation for you as a client, we are, that's business compartmentalized. And so I think that that's another big thing, especially like potentially, I think that the thing that's going to probably resonate the most with listeners is that they're going to have a friend who is also their contest prep coach. And so if they have a tiff within their friend, then they, you know, that doesn't bleed into their contest prep. Like that needs to just be their contest prep and the friend needs to be the friend. And so, and, and I think that I also got a lot of practice within this because one thing within our service, because it is as personal as it is, we build a lot of really good relationships with our clients. And so being able to compartmentalize of like, no, this is me being a friend to you. And this is me being a coach is very challenging. And not everyone's on that same page. And you have to be vocal with the other person of like, hey, this is where I'm coming from. And so for our dynamic, uh, it is a, it's a lot. And, and certainly we're not perfect at it. I would say we're very good at it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would say that every day is just wanting to be better with it. And I think that that's, as you have the commitment from both parties that you want to be better at it all the time. And every day is a progression of just 0.5% or 1% better. Um, and that is looked at as a victory, I think is a, an important piece. Yeah, I absolutely love that. And the the two big things that I would say to kind of wrap that up is you have to be willing to accept an apology and get over it and move on. And you also have to be willing to take that person's either criticism or their boundary and truly respecting it and making the best decision moving forward. So instead of like, if I'm start, because I really want to talk about something and I start talking about it and Alex says like, 
I'm not wearing that hat right now or I don't want to talk about it instead of being offended and hurt and resentful of how dare he not want to do that. I have to and I I internally have the conversation of, OK, he wasn't being rude to you. He was setting a boundary. You need to respect that and then carry that forward and switch those lanes. And then those apologies as well of like that example he said of this is where I was coming from. That wasn't the right thing. I apologize, X, Y, and Z. In the past, we used to like have things go on for days. And now we'll have something pop up. And let's say it's something even a little bit bigger, which we we really don't have fights because we're willing to have disagreements. And that's a huge thing is that we are willing to have conversation and disagreement. And that's why we don't have big blowups or big fights. Um, But it is something of when he apologizes to me and he truly means it, instead of just being like, well, you did that. I'm like, all right, I I can see that you truly are apologizing to me and I need to move on. And it's helped both of our mental healths, I would say, a ton for not having to be in this place of resentment or frustration all of the time just due to being able to trust the other person, have an honest conversation with them and know that, like Alex said, we're not trying to win. We're just trying to get better. And we'll text that to each other, say that to each other when one of us is having a hard day of I'll just reach over, touch his hand and say, like, we're a team. We, we've got this. Like, don't worry about it. We've got it. Or say, I, I accept your apology. Like, thank you. We're moving on from this or whatever it may be. Like, being able to say like, yes, I trust you, I believe you, and we're both moving on and moving that forward. Um, And then one other thing I'll say about just having different dynamics and relationships, especially not only with clients becoming friends or being friends, but also within our staff of we have friends on our staff. And so we do have different boundaries of, hey, um, like for prep, I mainly email him about prep stuff. We don't talk a lot about prep stuff per se, unless we say, hey, do we want to sit and talk about this right now? And then we'll have a prep conversation. But we don't really text about it or anything. It is through email for prep. And then for business, we use Slack. And then um, also like being able to contact him through um, his business phone and being like, this is business stuff that we're talking about. Um, And then being able to have like the personal stuff of, hey, we're going to text about this stuff. So we do have different mediums that we send stuff to respect those boundaries. And we've set those within our staff as well of saying, if I text you, it's personal. But if I slack you, that's business. Um, So that's been really helpful for us as well. Yeah. And I want to come back to the aspect of like accepting an apology and like truly meaning that because I think that a lot of this is is originated from us being kids and you would in my case potentially hit my sister steal something from my sister Gabrielle if you're listening I'm sure you're laughing at this and put her in a headlock <laughs> pull her hair or something yeah. and um, you be forced by your parents to apologize and and uh, like accept the apology so you could go and go outside and play with your friends or something along those lines so you're saying these things in a very empty manner to get what you want and it's not because of your it's not your parents fault because you are exhausting I'm sure at that age <laughs> and they just want you to get out of their hair more so. So I get it. But as you get into adulthood, a lot of individuals, including myself up until the time in which we got married, really, because we were still carrying that, you know, through the initial portion of our marriage Mm -hmm. of like, we would apologize and the individual would say, it's not a big deal. But like in reality, that was still a big deal and it was never really actually addressed. And so over the last however many years, I feel like we've gotten so much better at that of like, and you talked about this a little bit of, like when we say we're sorry, one, we truly mean that we're sorry. And we do not just say sorry immediately to like get yeah, that. We major. really don't. We ever. do not say sorry immediately. Like if I don't mean sorry yet, I'm not going to say it. And like that is a unknown thing between the two of us. And I'm also not going to accept an apology until I feel comfortable that I've truly digested what's happened and being able to truly move forward because it's not fair to the person in which is apologizing to you to say it's good. And then it'd be like, well, your, your actions are not, you know, actually saying that it's good. And so I think that that's another big thing, um, within all this too, of just like conflict resolution, communication. I know we're getting kind of off on a side tangent, but I do feel as though that it will be valuable for you all, um, to potentially think through these things, have conversations with your significant others, your, um, friends, coaches, things of that nature so that you can kind of navigate properly. 
Yeah. Um, and it's something that we, again, we vocalize those things. So if I apologize and he's not ready to accept it, he'll say like, I appreciate you apologizing, but I still need some time before I can like accept this. So it's not that I apologize. And then he's just like, no. Um, (laughs) and then I'm like, well, then why did I even apologize? And it's like a whole thing. Um, and we've gotten better of those situations of like, let's say the example he said of saying sorry, and then not actually being sorry. And then it coming up later of being, able to vet through those feelings of saying, well, the way that you said this, I interpreted it this way, and that's why I felt this way, and I'm feeling hurt in this way, because the other person just doesn't know. Like, Alex and I grew up very differently, and I don't know every single thought and like battle he's fought through and he doesn't know every single one that I and he doesn't know how I perceive things because perception and your um what's the word I'm looking for interpretation I don't know uh perception is not the same as like what you're trying to say basically so (laughs) I can say something and him perceive it completely different than what I'm trying to say and that doesn't make him wrong and it doesn't make me wrong it's just he perceived it differently and the more I can learn about how he perceived it the better communicator I can become for him and for each other of like I've point blank said to Alex like hey I perceived it this way and like that was really hurtful and he's like oh my gosh I didn't mean it that way and I'm like well I know you didn't mean it but it's still hurt and we need to work through how that's vocalized so we can get better so the more again honest and transparent you can be the better things are so instead of just being like no it's okay of saying it really hurt me because you know like this this and this is happening and this this is how it hurt me um, is just going to be better. But if you haven't <laughs> recognized, communication is freaking huge. We're huge <laughs> proponents of it. And the reason that I think it was even helpful to go into it, even though this started as just talking about my prep, is because this relationship for coach client wouldn't be possible without that communication and us running this business together alongside Austin, like wouldn't it be possible without communication. And I have seen what our relationship looked like before we were good at communicating (laughs) versus now. And that relationship feels so empty compared to what the relationship we have now. And it's so fulfilling to know, like, we've had a a few hard days recently, like just point blank we have. We have a lot on our plates. And instead of lashing out at each other, or even if we do temporarily lash out, we say, hey, I'm sorry, like that wasn't right of me to dump that on you. I've I've dumped on him. And then I've come back and been like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to do it that way. It just kind of happened. And he has to be able to say like, thank you for that apology. I'm moving forward and whatever it may be. But I mean, it it's skyrocketed our love for one another, um, <laughs> our skills and our our business and everything. Yeah. And people ask us a lot about our relationship and we like to keep a lot of things private. But the one thing that I will all, always publicly shout from the mountaintops is if you learn how to communicate, everything is going to be better with your friends and significant others and bosses and employees. Like it's not just romantic relationships, it's all relationships. Um, and so that's how it circles back to prep. Yeah. Sure. (laughs) Yeah. Because also your stress is if you're butting heads with either romantic relationships or friends or bosses and you can't communicate and then you can't even communicate that to your coach, that's where prep can also go downhill or just your results as a whole. Absolutely. Well, that's a little update on prep. (laughs) If you have questions, there's always a Google form in the show notes. So you can ask follow-up questions and we're more than happy to record other episodes on my prep as we go through the rest of this prep. Um, and be able to talk through that. Um, And if you're wanting more relationship stuff, um, then we'll be doing that over on YouTube. So you can ask that in the Google form as well, and we'll get back to you as a whole. But do you have any last things you want to wrap up as far as either my contest prep or contest prep in general that you think would be great to leave listeners with? Um, With the contest prep, I I think that, um, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I think that I'm just very proud of you. Thank very you. proud of the work that you've done through this prep and um, how hard you've worked and and still been able to pour into other things. Um, because oftentimes when people get into prep, it's all they do. And I wouldn't have pushed you to be in this prep if I 
thought any different of that because I knew how much was going to be on your plate with other things. And also, guys, we moved uh, six months ago. <laughs> not Well, not even yet. No. It's, yeah. uh, well, now I guess it's now six months. Yeah, six. Oh shoot! My yeah. gosh, where's the time gone? Yeah. Um. So yeah. Also, like managing the move. Um. A lot of things happening within the business structure, behind the scenes, within things, and um, Sue's been on the forefront of that. And and I think that there's not another person that I would have trusted to to do that. I know that myself. I, I even when I when people ask me about Sue's prep, I tell them that. Um, and one thing that many people speak on me of is my work ethic, things that I, there's a lot of things that I do. And I illustrate to people that the things that Sue is doing, I am not willing to do. I would not be willing to do the workload that she's taking on and prep. Mm -hmm. Like I would be very willing to take on the workload that she does without the prep, <laughs> not add on the very big bomb of what prep is. And being able to manage those things is very motivating to me. Uh, and I know it's very motivating to other people too. And I'm glad that you're having a, the space here to be able to speak to those things. And um, I'm hoping that listeners got a lot out of just hearing about all the, the stuff that you've got going on and um, some of the stuff that we've got going on as a whole. And yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And couldn't do it without you, point blank. And one thing I always like to kind of make a note of, especially with Alex or other people expressing how much that I'm doing, or I know that especially when we talk about gender roles, if I say something like cooking and cleaning, I want to make it very clear that that's another part of the dynamic that we figured out before prep, st prep started. We knew what roles each person does, and we both agreed on those roles and are okay with what those roles are and take those roles and move forward. So never get it twisted that, oh, Sue does so much and Alex does nothing, or Alex does so much and Sue does nothing. We are a team, point blank. We have divvied up the roles and we do what's on our plate. And when we need help, we talk to each other and we communicate. Um, ain't, but, ain't nobody want me to cook anyway. Yeah, yeah. that too. <laughs> but I, I, I feel like I get the comments of like, Alex is lucky or I wish so-and-so did that. But I'm lucky and I'm so thankful because we do work so well as a unit. And that's exactly what we are is I literally, like I mean it to my core, I couldn't do this without you. And you couldn't do it without me. And I think it's that like that joint of, I know that I'm lucky to have you and that you're lucky to have me. And I always have that mentality of like, Dang, Alex is a lucky guy. Yeah. And then me thinking I'm a lucky girl. And that's how it works is because I feel that he's just as lucky as I am of having one another. Yeah. So that's it. Catch us on the flippity flip.